Welcome to Ship It, a podcast about ops, oranges, and flame graphs. Today, we are talking with Frederick Brancic, founder of Polar Signals and Prometheus Maintainer. Some of you may remember Frederick from episode 33 when we introduced Parka.dev. In today's episode, we talk about a database built for observability, FrostDB, formerly known as ArcticDB. eBPF generates a lot of high cardinality data, which requires a new approach to writing, persisting, and then reading back the state. My TLDR is that FrostDB is sub zero cool and well worthy of its name. Do you know what else is cool? Fastly, for serving our content with minimal latency right from their edge. Learn more at fastly.com. This episode is brought to you by MongoDB, the makers of MongoDB Atlas, the multi-cloud application data platform. Atlas provides an integrated suite of data services centered around a cloud database designed for scale, speed, and simplicity. You can ditch the columns and the rows once and for all and switch to a database loved by millions for its flexible schema and query API. When you're ready to launch Atlas layers on production grade resilience, performance and security so you can confidently scale your project from zero to one. Atlas is a truly multi-cloud database. Deploy your data across multiple regions simultaneously on AWS, Azure and Google Cloud. Yes, you heard that right. Distribute your data across multiple cloud providers at the same time. The next step is to try Atlas free today. It have a free forever tier, prove yourself and your team that the platform has everything you need. Head to mongodb.com slash changelog. Again, mongodb.com slash changelog. We are going to ship in three, two, one. Frederick, welcome back to Ship It, just in time for summer. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. So we last met in episode 33, Merry Shipmas. It was Christmas, can you believe it? And it's almost summer, so six months ago. And we had a great time talking about trying out Parka. And I enjoyed trying it out. And yeah, uh, Michal Kuracic, thank you for figuring out what we're doing wrong with Erlang Perf Maps. That was Parka Agent Issue 145. So thank you, Michal, for helping us figure it out. And this happened very recently. Thank you, David. David Ansari for writing that amazing blog post, how to use uh, PProf with uh, and how to do flame graphs with RabbitMQ and mentioning Parka. I'm really excited to see what happens next. That was very nice to see. We'll drop a link in the show notes. And Kemal, he wrote two blog posts on various topics, which there's like lots of things happening in this space. So... Do you want to tell us more about it, Frederick? Like, because it's like the tip of the iceberg, literally the tip of the polar signals iceberg. There's been so <laughs> many things happening in the background. Yeah, I mean, where to start, right? I think one of the most exciting things that are, have nothing to do with software for, for us at Polar Signals is that we grew the team a, t- a ton since we last mm. talked. I think we doubled the team since you and I talked last. So we're now 11 people, mm. which is extremely exciting to see organizationally Mm -hmm. Uh, but then of course the software that we're building is becoming ever better ever more more features and more stable and everything yeah i think it's cool that you started with the with the erlang bit because that's kind of where we left off last and it's entirely random that just yesterday that rabbitmq blog post was to know control of you or me <laughs> was published, right? Showing that yeah. um, what we were trying to do last time is properly supported by Erlang. You know, when things are meant to happen, they just happen. <laughs> just sit back and just let them happen. Just going with the flow, big fan of that. And seeing things yeah. come together this way, we're definitely on the right track with this. So I know that Kemal, Kemal Akoyun, he was with mm-hmm. you back in December. He wrote two blog posts, amazing blog posts on this topic fantastic symbols and where to find them, part one and two. We'll drop them in the show notes. And they explain a lot more of the issues that we were seeing and the issues were specifically symbolizing stack traces. Kemal did an amazing job explaining it in great detail. There's some screenshots there. David covers a lot of this in his blog post, the recent blog post. So it's a really deep dive into this topic. And I I really enjoy these like fantastic people uh, spending a lot of time 
just to explain in very detailed terms what the problem is, why it's important, how it works. Big fan of that too. So in these six, six months, what changed with Parka? Parka.dev. So I think almost everything has changed at least a little bit. Uh, since you mentioned the work that Kemal has been doing in all of the blog posts that he's been writing, the blog posts are kind of the result of all of his work, right? Like basically they're the blog posts that he wished he had had when he was working on this because there's so much archaic information out there or like basically like Linux has grown over the last 30 years. My gosh. And like even before that, like elf binaries, like they've been around for a very long time. And yeah, there's just a lot of intricate things that can happen. And then there are random things that compilers do to binaries to optimize them. And that kind of just all makes our life really miserable, but also kind of interesting in profiling world. Mm. And yeah, so Kemal has kind of like one of the really important things that kind of came out of all of this work that Kemal was doing and what ultimately resulted in those blog posts as well is uh, something called position independent executables mm -hmm. support for these. And the reason why this is really important is basically all binaries or all like shared objects, shared libraries. So think of libc is kind of the one that basically everything dynamically links to, right? Mm -hmm. But anything you can think of that is like a shared, shared object, shared uh, library in Linux, those are position independent executables. And that the term comes from that they can essentially be mapped into memory, into random places in the process, basically. And even if they are mapped in those random places, we can still kind of translate those memory addresses back to something that is understandable uniquely for that, for that shared library. So even if there are two different binaries that do completely different things with these libraries, the shared object is the same one and we can treat it as the same one. Mm -hmm. So that was really important so that we can do analysis of like an entire infrastructure where, as I said, lots of binaries link to the same libraries and we can then link all of this information and say, hey, there are like hundreds of binaries using this function in libc that is super unoptimized or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Not that that's really the case. Libc is a very well-optimized library, but you get the idea. It's basically a superpower in order to get like whole system visibility. Yeah. So that's exciting. And kind of as a bonus, every Rust binary out there is a position independent executable. So that means that just by doing all of this work, we, we now support Rust even better than we did before. That's amazing. That's amazing. The one thing, so I thank you for slowing me down because you're right, this is important, like to talk about those two blog posts, the fantastic symbols and where to find them. The first one, the ELF, a Linux executable walked through that picture. I think it's worth a thousand words in this case. It explains so well how this breaks down, how the ELF binary breaks down, what it is, uh, sorry, the ELF format. And there's so much to that. And then in, in part two, where we talk about JIT and uh, Node is given as an example, how does it actually work in practice? It's really nice to see that and to basically connect those dots because there's, a, as you mentioned, the, the, the problem space is huge. And if you're missing those fundamentals, it's very difficult to understand how the pieces fit together and what are you even looking at. Why is this important? David, he wrote it in the Improving RabbitMQ Performance blog post. He showed the importance of understanding what is happening at a very low level when it comes to reasoning about performance, when it comes to improving performance in whatever you're running. So where is the time spent? Where is the, what, what is least efficient? And because these things are so complicated, can we have a universal language, please, to understand what is happening? And I think to a great extent, eBPF allows us to do things that were not possible before or were very, very hard before, and only a handful of people were able to pull this one off. And even then, spend a lot of time. Brendan Gregg came, came to mind, as comes to mind. He did so much for the flame graph, understanding, CPU sampling, CPU profiling, all that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think kind of our mission with the, with the Parka project is to take all of this information from all of these communities and kind of bundle it into, into one, right? Like, like you said, mm -hmm. 
Brendan Gregg has done, done like phenomenal work showing us how to profile like Java applications, but also native binaries. And then there are like completely on the other side of the spectrum, right? There are really amazing Python and Ruby profilers. Like one that I'm really excited about is um, Ruby Spy that was originally created by Julie Evans. And it basically outlines how we're going to have support for CPU profiling for Ruby pro processes as well. And that's what I'm kind of trying to say, right? Like we, we learned also about Erlang, right? That's kind of something that actually came out of this podcast, which I think is really exciting. Just kind of getting all of these pieces together so that we can have actual whole system profiling so that we can look at our entire infrastructure as one, right? Regardless of what language we're talking about. And as we can see based on this podcast, right? That's a, that's a long road to go, but it's one worth going. I really like how simple you make this. I think that's one of my favorite aspects of Parka, how something that's very complex. And if you have to do this by hand, just, just go and look through the, all the instructions. And if you haven't done this, you realize like by step number five or six, you go, you know what, do, do I really want to do this? Like you're questioning whether you, you really want to do that. That's just how involved it, involved it is. And having an open source project that does this, that makes this really, really easy. That's what just got me excited the first time I heard about Parka, because I knew how difficult it is to get it right. And I think everyone that, that spent a bit of time with PProf and um, which is the other one, DBG, no, GDB. Oh my goodness me. Oh, wow. That's like another tool, which is so difficult to use. And then I had like to spend a bit of time there and I al almost always forgot like my steps. There's like so many. So unless you do this all day, every day, it's, it's really hard stuff. And Parka makes it simple. And I love that story. It's funny that you phrase it in that way, because I was talking a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to like a high frequency trading company. And as I think everybody can imagine, cut like shaving off a single CPU cycle is a competitive advantage to them, right? And even in those kinds of environments, they were telling us that like they love how we're going the extra mile and doing continuous profiling, but they would already be happy with profiling products that just made it easier to do profiling, right? So we're kind of doing multiple things there, right? Like we're doing exactly that, like you already said. And then we're also going that extra step of actually giving them performance data of all of time and not just a single point in time. Yeah. And just as we've shown in episode 33, there's even like a pull request that goes with it. It's anyone can take this. If you have Kubernetes, it's super simple. One command and you have it. That's all it takes. And it's open source. You're free to, you know, do like look at it, contribute to it you know, make it your own, whatever you want to do with it, because it's it's such an important piece of technology, um, I think. So yeah. speaking of which, I've noticed straight off the bat your website. Yeah. And I think <laughs> like, wow, like parka.dev, <laughs> I really like the new website. Like I, tell us a little bit about that because I haven't seen such a big change, such a positive change happen, like in just like within a couple of months. What's the story behind it? Honestly, that has very little to do with our team and has all to do with the really incredible team at Pixel Point. So they're like a web consultancy, but I had known them through, like I got to know them through some other open source projects. So they did the website for the K6 project. They did the website for drone at one Cilium. point. Yes, Cilium. I think even maybe even the eBPF IO website. I'm not 100% sure. But mm. basically, they've become kind of the, the web consultancy for open source projects and like deep tech projects. And so I was really excited to kind of just reach out to them and see if they're interested in a project like this and working with us because we felt like, you know, we needed a makeover for the parka.dev website. And they are just absolutely mind-blowingly amazing. Like, they they really try to understand what Parka does. And they themselves got really excited about it, right? That, of course, is a bonus. But because they tried so hard to actually understand what Parka does, mm. they were able to tell the story really amazingly. And then they're also just brilliant designers you know yeah i want to give a huge shout out to pixel point 
because I rarely see a website that I think captures something as well as parka.parka.dev does. I really like the story. I mean, I knew Parka, but it just basically opened it up like in ways which I was like surprisingly, that they were surprising to me. And uh, even like the screenshots, they got them spot on. Like <laughs> how it works, why it's important, all that good stuff. Good job, Pixel Point. Yeah. Good job. Actually, it's a funny, funny thing. One of the things that actually kind of went the other way was we did the screenshots and they were like, can we edit the screenshots to look prettier, right? And we were like, I don't think that's being genuine to our users or potential users, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happened was they made the edits to the screenshots and then we actually implemented those changes in Parka so that it would actually look that way, right? And then it kind of, then we did real screenshots again. Oh, wow. And so that was a cool collaboration that I think, you know, unless you ask about it, you don't really find out. But like, yeah. aside from the website, they actually also influenced the way that Parka looks today. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that because when I looked at the new website and I've seen the flame grass, my first thought was, hang on, they, they didn't look like this. Like they are like, are, is this real? Like, has this actually happened? Ran the update, check the new flame graphs and they're exactly the same. I was, and I remember that we talked about this around episode 33 and I was thinking, yeah. hmm, that's one thing which could do with some improving because it's a bit difficult to understand certain things. Still, you know, huge improvement over what we had before, but, you know, not as easy as it could be. And it was great to see. That's one of the first things which I've noticed. The other thing which I noticed is your favorite Easter egg. <laughs> Can you tell yeah. us a, a bit about it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is awesome. I mean, it's it's kind of a design gimmick, right? But yeah. it, I think it's really cool that, uh, like, we talked a, a, already about Parker and the relationship to EBPF. Mm -hmm. And, like, EBPF has this B as, as a logo, right? And as you scroll through the website, the B kind of mm -hmm. flies through the picture and, like, out, out of the website, which I think is... I love that detail. I'm disappointed if a website doesn't have an Easter egg. I think Chingard <laughs> spoiled it for us with like the hair on the various people. I mean, now I'm looking for Easter eggs and I think changelog.com needs an Easter egg too. If Jared is listening to this, that's okay. And if not, I'll mention it in our next Kaizen. But uh, Easter eggs are so important. They just, you know, like play and, you know, having a bit of fun is so important yeah. because our day-to-day it's hard enough as it is. Let's be honest about it. So every little opportunity to have a bit of fun, I think we should okay. seize it. And, you know, that's that's how I think of Easter eggs. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Fire Hydrant. Fire Hydrant is the reliability platform for every developer. Incidents, they impact everyone, not just SREs. They give teams the tools to maintain service catalogs, respond to incidents, communicate through status pages, and learn with retrospectives. What would normally be manual, error-prone tasks across the entire spectrum are responding to an incident. They can all be automated in every way with Fire Hydrant. They have incident tooling to manage incidents of any type with any severity with consistency declare and mitigate incidents all from inside slack service catalogs allow service owners to improve operational maturity and document all your deploys in your service catalog incident analytics allow you to extract meaningful insights about your reliability over any facet of your incident or the people who respond to them and at the heart of it all incident run books they let you create custom automation rules convert manual tasks into automated reliable repeatable sequences that run when you want you can create Slack channels, Jira tickets, Zoom bridges instantly after declaring an incident. Now your processes can be consistent and automatic. The next step is to try it free. Small teams up to 10 people can get started for free with all Fire Hydrant features included. No credit card is required. Get started at firehydrant.io. Again, firehydrant.io. So I think that you can almost anticipate this question because I think I asked it last time. Do you use Parka profile Parka.dev? All the time. Nice. All the time, yes. So specifically our demo cluster. So if you go to demo.parka.dev, mm -hmm. that's Parka profiling itself, but also the Parka agent profiling itself. So it's all super meta. 
And actually we have like a Prometheus setup that is monitoring it as well. Mm. And so all of this we're kind of using to do improvements all the time and to figure out whether the improvements that we're doing actually make sense and have the desired effect. I think that's so important. Dog fooding your own product and the thing that you're working on in this case, like your open source, would you call it a product? Would you say Parka is a product or a project? Parka is the project. And then Polar Signals Cloud is the product. Right. So Parka, the open source project, using it and seeing the improvements and like even for itself, it's so important. But I have noticed this this blog post about profiling Next.js apps with Parka. And that made me think, oh, hang on, you know, there must be something more to it. And I know that Parka.dev runs on Vercel, which is the Next.js company. And in that case, I was thinking you must be doing something uh, with the website as well. I haven't seen that in the demo. Maybe I wasn't paying enough attention. But the fact that it's the live, is it for the website itself as well? Okay, so parka.dev itself is is a 100% a static website that's hosted on Vercel. So okay. that we're not we're not profiling, though. Maybe we can partner with Vercel one day and, <laughs> and profile all of the applications there. That's not something that we're doing today. But actually, Polar Signals Cloud is Next.js, mm-hmm. and that we're profiling with Parka. And is that what the demo does? No, that's no. just an, that's our like internal Polar Signals Cloud project. I've noticed that it runs on K3s. Is it Sivo by any chance? It's Sivo, yeah. Nice. Okay, I I can see it. I can see it. That was really nice. Like click on the demo, and I was like, I was wanting to know more about it, where it runs, how it's set up, what is being profiled. And I'm glad that you mentioned all those things because now it just makes a lot more sense in my head. So the other thing, which I just reading around and, you know, doing a bit of research, I've seen you mention that Matthias recently fixed some things in the Polar Signals IO pipeline, the continuous delivery pipeline. So six minutes from PR to dry run, Diff yeah, yeah, in the Kate's Report cluster. How does this relate to Parka? I think I don't think this is Parka.dev, right? This is just for the agent, for the server. This is the like Polar Signals cloud product. So basically, like we have a, a mono repo that runs that kind of contains all of Polar Signals cloud, and within that repo, we now have from like opening the PR to doing a dry dry run um, apply to our Kubernetes cluster within six minutes. So that includes like building all of the container images, running like previews of the UI, all of these things, everything in six minutes. So in six minutes, you can basically try out your change in a like staging like environment. And it will tell you when you merge this pull request, this is the changes that we're going to be applying to the production Kubernetes cluster. Okay. Okay. So I'm just trying like in my head to imagine how do you view if the changes are positive or negative? So do you look at the profiles? Do you have some, how does that work to see if the change that you're rolling out is a good one? So in, in this case, it was just that we uh, did much more aggressive caching in our like builds. So mm-hmm. here it was really just seeing whether the total runtime was less than what we had before. Mm-hmm. But that was like, that was very noticeable because before it was like, 26 minutes. Okay. And after doing some very aggressive caching, we got down to to six minutes. Okay. So yeah, what runs the CI C D? Is it GitHub Actions and it's what does the caching? Yeah. Okay. We we just do like so previously we did we did most of our caching through like Docker layers, mm-hmm. but we ran into a couple of issues with that where I wasn't I don't remember exactly anymore what the problem was, but there were some permission issues and we couldn't figure out why that was happening mm-hmm. and the like saving and loading of docker caches was actually taking longer than running the builds and so we decided we're not going to do the actual build within the docker files anymore we're going to do like because we have 100% static statically linked go binaries that's all that polar signals cloud is made up of so we're building the the statically linked binaries before and then we just put those into container into into containers. Okay. And so basically all we're doing is we're using the Go caching from GitHub Actions now. I see. I see. Okay. So it's I think you're thinking about the build kit caching. So the build kit caching integration with the GitHub Actions cache is slower than actually running the commands. 
and I have seen this before and there's like a great story for another time behind that. And Eric is someone that I work with and he's one of the BuildKit core maintainers and, you know, he's well aware of this and he's, he's working towards a solution. But I, I, I know what you mean. I know that sometimes using the layer caching, the BuildKit layer caching with GitHub Actions can be slower for sure. Okay, that makes sense. So where do you build those binaries, the, Go, the statically linked Go binaries? Those we built just through normal GitHub Actions. Okay. And like beforehand, we load the Go mod cache from previous runs, and then we save the cache if it, if it changes. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I can see that. So in six minutes, you get your change out in the staging cluster, and then what happens afterwards? I mean, then people who review it. The cool thing is because we also run like previews on Vercel. Basically, you can try out the entire pull request after six minutes, right? Like you, we've yeah. got like a, the UIs that can either be pointed at different versions of the API or even the, the like production API, because, you know, most of the time it's either or, right? Like a pull mm-hmm. request that only j- does changes to the front end. And in right. that case, it's actually nicer if you can just use production data immediately. So, Yeah. And then if it's approved and merged, then within the next six minutes, it's going to be deployed. Nice. How many deploys do you do per day? Because this sounds very efficient. You must be doing a lot. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on what people are working on. But like we can, we can easily do tens of deploys if we want to. That's very nice. That makes a huge difference. Being able to make small changes, try them out in the final place where they will run, gaining that confidence and then just, you know, saying, yep, this looks good to me. And then, you know, a few minutes later, in this case, several minutes later, you have it. Nice. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you have to roll back? A change had unexpected consequences in production that were not visible in staging? Absolutely. That's where kind of another really cool piece comes into play. So one of my uh, colleagues, I think you mentioned Matthias already, Mm -hmm. he built a really cool tool called Pira, uh, which is for planning but also maintaining and kind of tracking SLOs. And all of our APIs have SLOs through Pira. And so when we have a genuine user impact through a merge, then we get notified within you know, a couple of minutes. And then we can easily roll back the change. And at worst, we have the time that it took to alert us, which is usually somewhere between five to 10 minutes if you know there's a really drastic problem. Mm. And then we roll back. So turn around 16 to 20 minutes until we would have rolled back a a severe change. That sounds like a very nice setup. Very, very nice. I bet it must be so nice working with all all this tooling that like you mostly built and you understand how everything fits together and you have like a very nice and efficient system of getting changes out. And if something I don't want to say breaks if something, you know, behaves unexpectedly, you can go back and you can see when that happens. So I know that you mentioned Pira last time that we talked. I don't remember how much of it made it in the final conversation in the episode. But can you tell us a bit more about it and how is it coming along since we last? Because I remember you mentioning it. I was excited about it, but I didn't have time to follow up on that. So I highly recommend actually that you do an episode with Matthias because he's much more qualified to talk about it than I am because I'm just a user. Matthias is the creator and he just does everything around that project. And really it's not, it's not anything that we do at Polar Signals. It's just something he's also passionate about. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it made its way into Polar Signals infrastructure (laughs) and it's an amazing tool. Like I find myself not going to like Prometheus Alert Manager or even Prometheus, when I get a page, my first thing, the first thing I do is I hop into Pira and see like what my like error rate, error budget burn rate is and how severe this change is actually affecting my users. So Pira itself is, like I said, a tool to manage SLOs essentially, specifically for Prometheus setups. It doesn't integrate into anything else. And that's just because that's the only tool that we use. But with Pira, you can kind of say, I have this gRPC API that I have metrics for in Prometheus. And I have this goal of like three nines, right? Like 99.9 or 99.95. And then Pira will automatically generate multi 
window error burn rates. So this is a very long term. And there's a lot of theory behind this, why these alerts are better than like a, a normal threshold of like 1% or 0.1% error rate is happening right now. Because we don't really care if that error rate happens once and just spikes for a very brief second, right? Mm -hmm. We actually care about, are we going to fulfill our promise to our users over the next 30 days or yeah. within the last 30 days, right? And so we really only want to get paged if we are in danger of violating that kind of contract that we have with our, with our users, right? Mm -hmm. And so multi-error burn rates essentially calculate how quickly are we burning our error budget and if we continue at this rate are we going to run out of error budget so essentially when are we going to get to that point where we're violating that contract we have with uh, with our users so that's essentially pira allows you to to efficiently manage those but also it's just much smarter than i am for example to <laughs> generate those Prometheus alerts because there's a lot of math behind this that you re really need to understand pretty deeply to to do useful alerts. And Matthias has spent countless hours studying this and really implementing something really unique with Pira. All right, that's a conversation that I'm really looking forward to. Thank you for mentioning it. I remember last time when, again, we just briefly talked about it, but the focus was something else. Now that you mention it again, this 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 comes up and there's the demo.pyra, P-Y-R-R-A.dev. That's really interesting. It's pyra.dev on, 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 on GitHub. This is something that, you know, like we you have like those projects that people get like ideas. They are very excited about for a few months and then they stop being as excited and then, you know, becomes like abandoned where this doesn't seem to be that. And uh, I really like that, you know, like a lot of interest is on this, like you're using it, you're seeing the benefits of it longer term, more than a few months. And I'm very curious to see where this goes. I think this has some great potential. And I like how Matthias is thinking about it for sure. So that one's coming up. Thank you, Frederick, for mentioning that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he'll, he'll, he'll be happy to do an episode with you. Amazing. So... I'd like us to take this like a half point. So I'd like us to do like a conversation cleanser, but I would like to talk about the orange farm. So I'd like <laughs> us to tell us more about that orange farm, <laughs> Frederick. <laughs> yeah, what, so, what is this orange farm? <laughs> so just before KubeCon EU, we as Polar Signals did our very first in-person offsite. So oh. for those who, who don't know, Polar Signals was founded end of 2020. So COVID pandemic was in full swing. Oh, yes. Full, Full swing, swing. Yeah. yeah. And so we, we're a fully remote company. And up until that point, I, even as the founder, hadn't seen a lot of the people who we ended up hiring at Polo Signals in person. And so we spent kind of the entire week before KubeCon together, kind of partly working, doing like hackathons and doing some strategic planning, but also, you know, just spending time, to, some quality time together. Mm. And yeah, one of the kind of team events that we that we did was we went to an orange farm in Valencia because mm. like KubeCon EU was in Valencia and Valencia is famous for their like orange farms. And I love orange juice. <laughs> okay, I can see where this is going. I can see where it's going. <laughs> and we went to this really lovely orange farm just outside of Valencia. Mm. We booked kind of like a private tour on the farm where mm. they kind of taught us through like the history of how like modern day oranges were even developed and like personal history of their family and the orange farm and so on. And yeah, we got to like pick oranges right off of the tree and they told us how to actually eat oranges, which apparently I've been doing wrong all my life. So how do you do it? No, hang on. This is important. How, how should you <laughs> eat oranges? <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah, I didn't know this, but essentially you take the orange with the like stem upwards right like mm -hmm. the green part upwards and you just kind of bite into it and you kind of bite out the top part of the orange mm -hmm. and then you kind of you throw that part away and then you can kind of squeeze the orange orange juice into your mouth and kind of drink it and then once you've squeezed kind of most of it you kind of just break break it open and then you eat the flesh wow. and you can actually do that without making a mess like it's mind-blowing <laughs> okay 
Wow, that sounds like great tips. Thank you very much for that. And that sounds like a great team activity. I know it's really hard to adjust like to the new reality because we always thought like that's like short term, you know, things will come back to normal, we'll be back in offices, but that hasn't happened. Yeah. I'm not seeing it. I think the world has moved on to a new model where most of us are remote. There's no office. I mean, who would have thought that this will become the norm, especially yeah. among the startups? And that has so many benefits. One of the drawbacks is that you don't get to spend in-person time, quality time with the people that you work with because it makes a huge difference. And activities like this just create those bonds which are so important to a good, healthy team. And I'm glad that you're taking every opportunity you can to do that. It's so important to build a healthy team and a healthy company. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Okay. This episode is brought to you by Sentry. Build better software faster, diagnose, fix, and optimize the performance of your code. More than a million developers in 68,000 organizations already use Sentry, and that includes us. Here's the easiest way to try Sentry. Head to sentry.io slash demo slash sandbox. That is a fully functional version of Sentry that you can poke at. And best of all, our listeners get the team plan for free for three months. Head to Sentry.io and use the code CHANGELOG when you sign up. Again, Sentry.io and use the code CHANGELOG. And by Chronosphere. When it comes to observability, teams need a reliable, scalable, and efficient solution so they can know about issues well before their customers do. They need a solution that helps them move faster than the competition. And companies born in the cloud native era often start with Prometheus for monitoring, which is obviously an amazing piece of software, but they quickly push it to its limits and often outgrow it. They run into issues with siloed data, missing long-term storage, and wasted engineering time firefighting the monitoring system versus delivering their application with confidence. They describe the system as a house of cards, where a single developer's seemingly benign change can overload the whole monitoring system, or they say they're flying blind because they pride themselves on making data-driven decisions, but losing visibility means they lose this competitive edge. Ryan Sokol, VP of Engineering at DoorDash, has this to say about Chronosphere, quote, The visibility and control that Chronosphere's platform gives us to manage our observability data and costs are a game changer, especially with our unprecedented growth, end quote. Chronosphere is the observability platform for clouding of teams operating at scale. Learn more and get a demo at chronosphere.io. Again, chronosphere.io. So there's another huge thing that happened just before KubeCon, just before KubeCon EU. You introduced arctic db and that's what i would like us to talk about next so what is arctic db and why does the world need something like arctic db yeah this is something that i've been excited about building for a really long time and i've kind of been thinking about this problem space for a really long time so kind of in the name it's a new database right mm -hmm. it's an embedded database written in go so Maybe listeners are uh, familiar to like Badger DB or Level DB or even kind of kind of like Rocks DB, mm -hmm. where you know you you you're using it as a library in your application to build something around, right? I guess S2 Lite is the <laughs> is the yeah. most classic example of this. And Arctic DB is a columnar database. So as opposed to many many other databases where um, let's say in SQLite, for example, typically the data is stored in rows, right? If you insert a new row into your SQLite database, physically on disk, all of the data that belongs to the same row are physically co-located. Mm -hmm. That's a row-based database. And then a columnar database, we store all of the values of an entire column co-located. And that's really useful when you want to do analytics of the data. Mm -hmm. So if you want to scan an entire column and let's say you you want to aggregate it, you want to sum all of the values in there, or you want to do comparisons of strings or something like that, mm -hmm. it just turns out that our like the way that 
computers work, that's much more efficient to do than doing kind of random access on disk and loading individual pieces off of this to do those things. And so that's why we, for Parka, needed a columnar database. Uh, we kind of realized that pretty early on. And I have some kind of prior experience with the Prometheus TSDB, which if you squint a lot, is also a columnar database, mm -hmm. but like highly, highly optimized for the Prometheus use case. The one thing that is additionally kind of different in, in Arctic DB that really there's no other database out there that allows you to do something like this, which is we have kind of semi-flexible schemas. So you can define a schema and you can say these row, these columns must always be there if you insert a new row. But then we also have something called that we call dynamic columns. And this is specifically useful for kind of label style data, similar to what Prometheus has, right? We want to be able to attach labels to specific data points so that we can then slice and dice data by random infrastructure labels, right? Like it can be the region of our data center. It can be the name of our data center. It can be our namespace in our Kubernetes cluster. It can be our pod. It can be our container. It can be our process ID, right? Like we as Polar Signals don't want to dictate how you organize your infrastructure. And so we want to give you that flexibility mm. to choose the labeling however you like it. That philosophy came from Prometheus, right? And we felt like that was one of the things that made Prometheus really successful. And so it's something that we felt like we had to replicate. But the nature of profiling data means that we have unique sets of labels much more often than Prometheus. And this is kind of the classic cardinality problem that people run into with, with Prometheus. And there's nothing wrong with Prometheus' design for that, with that, right? Prometheus is like not meant for the like undefined, unbound cardinality use cases. It can actually handle them surprisingly well, but it wasn't designed in that way, right? Again, nothing wrong with that, but continuous profiling needed something different because we don't know what stack traces will occur, how often they will occur, right? That's completely random. It depends on what the process is actually executing. Mm -hmm. And so we needed a storage that actually internalizes that and where we don't pay a penalty for cardinality. And so essentially the way it's done in ArcticDB is that every time we see a new label key, we dynamically create a new column that is then inserted into and everything else just is treated as this column is just null basically for all other rows. So I'm really gl glad that you mentioned this because cardinality used to keep come up. I mean, I think I'm sure it still does in the context of Prometheus. And I know that that had memory implications as well as disk implications. It would basically use up more memory, more disk space to store the data. Does it affect Arctic DB? in the same way when it comes to memory size and disk size? Does ArcticDB use more memory and more disk if there are more labels? So there's at least one fundamental point here that I, I, I think I need to point out, which is if you have more data, then you need to pay for it in some way, right? Like there's, there's no such thing as storing data for free, right? Like if we're able to do that, then I think like right. the fundamentals of, of computing change. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. <laughs> but the characteristics of paying for cardinality are dramatically different. In Prometheus, we want to keep series of data alive for as long as possible because that improves compression. And that's ultimately what or one of the pieces that make Prometheus as efficient as it is. Yeah. Again, that's why, I'm, that's why I keep going back to this is a good design for Prometheus because it allows Prometheus to exploit several pieces of that equation to be able to serve things like the super low latency queries like Prometheus does. In Arctic DB, we're not paying per series. We're basically paying per row that we're inserting. Yeah. And the point is we're kind of bringing the cost of inserting a row down so much that we don't care anymore that we, uh, how many columns we have in that row. So it's where basically our, our penalty is, or our cost is 
at the row level as opposed to the cardinality level. I see, I see. Okay, that makes sense. Because when we used to have lots and lots of labels on metrics in Prometheus, what used to happen when you would query them, you would use a lot of memory. So things would take a lot longer. And if you wanted to have them optimized, you would use, I think, more disk space, if I remember correctly, and memory. So I'm wondering, like those ad hoc queries, which you don't know what labels you'll be querying for. So then you just add up I mean, you don't have to declare what the labels are because I think it will also like create different time series. If I remember correctly, this is like all coming back. I haven't used it like in in maybe, I don't know, a year now, give or take six months, something like that. And the more labels you would have, like the more time series you would get. Is that right? That's right. Every unique combination of labels identifies a time series in Prometheus. That's it. And then that, that is what was resulting in that excessive storage and excessive memory usage, like disk space and memory. And if Parka doesn't do that, that's amazing because that means like the cost of a label is much, much lower than it is in Prometheus. As you say, two different systems designed for specific use cases, but Arctic DB seems to have solved this cardinality tackled, tackled head on the problem of cardinality which makes a huge difference. So does that mean that you can store the samples or the profiles that you get with arbitrary labels like customer names or service names or things like that? Because that opens up the world to a host of new possibilities if, if you do that. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And like one of the first things that we started implementing once we had our uh, we haven't released this yet, but it's something that I've talked about a couple of times already is that we attach a trace ID to a stack trace. So that way, mm. what we can do is we can pull up all of the CPU time that was created by a single request, right? Across services, right? Because we have a single trace ID that is piped through all of our services. Mm. Now, this only does work if you have, if you actually have like application level instrumentation for profiling as well, because the profiler needs to know about that trace ID somehow. Yeah. But if you put in that work, and it's not a lot of work, as a matter of fact, this can actually be done as kind of an open telemetry wrapper. So you can, you only need to kind of install a library and then you have all of that information automatically. And then you can jump from like a distributed trace to all of the profiling data associated with that with that request or, you know, whatever your trace ID represents. So because you mentioned how Prometheus is being used for, like, not as it was designed and people abuse it, here's a crazy idea. And you tell me if Arctic DB would be abused if it was used for this purpose, what would happen if Arctic DB would be used to store events with arbitrary labels? Would it work? That's exactly the use case that it's built for. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Nice. Yeah, you could absolutely use ArcticDB to store distributed tracing data or log mm -hmm. data. It's not something that we're focusing on ourselves right now, just because you know it's it's important for us to stay focused on of course. Uh, continuous profiling. But I think the possibilities are exciting. And like one of the first comments that we got when we open sourced ArcticDB was, "Can we use this instead of like Prometheus TSDB?" Right to like solve some of the, the cardinality issues. And definitely this is a possibility, but also mm. like we need to take it with a grain of salt, right? Like Arctic DB, we open sourced it the moment it started working. Mm -hmm. And like Prometheus TSDB has had seven years of performance optimizations, right? Like I think there is a possibility in the future to explore mm -hmm. that path further, but it's definitely gonna take a while. Yeah. For to sure. get any sort of similar performance characteristics. And like I said, Prometheus was specifically designed for those like super low latency queries. So the fundamental setup does mean that Prometheus should always outperform Arctic DB. But Arctic DB, I think, can get pretty close because of a couple of tricks that we that we're doing with the with the data. Mm. So let me see if I got this right. Prometheus was optimized for metrics. Arctic DB is optimized and built for events. I don't know if I would even call it events. It's really just tagged data, right? Like whatever that means to you, right? Mm -hmm. Like I wrote with a couple of people who want to store like super high cardinality data that they're grabbing from eBPF 
And this is totally possible. And there's not no like existing type of data that could mm -hmm. be could be used to describe this. It's just super high cardinality data that you want to search by a label based mm -hmm. system. One last question before we move from the Arctic DB topic. Well, kind of. Um, is there a single process of Arctic DB? I mean, okay, so, so so first of all, it is embedded. That's something that you mentioned, and that is important. Yeah. Does it have any primitives when it comes to clustering? Does it understand the cluster of processes that have Arctic DB embedded? So that's something that we're building like for Polar Signals Cloud right now. Mm -hmm. And it's possible that we'll open source this um, in the future. Like the reality is just like we're a business. We need to at some point start making some money, right? Of course, <laughs> so it's of just course. something that we haven't spent too much time on. But it's something, it's definitely a path that we want to keep open. And mm -hmm. I think it's inevitable that we'll probably do this eventually. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it's just something that we, we purely need in order to run Polar Signals Cloud mm -hmm. today. So that's why we're building it. And then we'll see what we'll do with it potentially in the, in the open source community. Before we talk about the Polar Signals Cloud, I would like to cover some of the shout outs for Arctic DB because I've seen that you've collaborated with a lot of people on this. So it's not just you, you know, coming up with a crazy idea and no, seeing how it works. Not. So you mentioned some amazing people. Uh, the one which I would like to start with is uh, Tyler Neely. I didn't even know about him until you mentioned him. He's been building Rust databases since 2014, SLED and Rio. So he has a lot of experience. I was watching one of his FOSTEM talks from 2020. He's smart. <laughs> like... You know, My God. Like genius Tyler smart, is. sort of. Yes. <laughs> so tell us more about the people that you collaborated on Arctic DB, at least the ideas. Yeah, let's start with Tyler, actually. So so Ty I've known Tyler for six years, seven years almost. He actually rented a desk from us at CoreOS Times in the CoreOS Berlin office. Mm -hmm. And he was already, like, he has some history at, like, Mesosphere building, like, working on Zookeeper as well. And, yeah, just any crazy like distributed system or like high performance databases that you can think of he's had his hands on somehow and yeah i'm just also friends with with tyler i like to you know go for a coffee with him or something and we just have common interests and so i was saying i was talking to him that like we're thinking about building this new database uh, with these kind of characteristics and i i'm not sure about our model for like transactions. And so we just spent kind of several hours together discussing various isolation and uh, consistency mechanisms. And ultimately what we ended up implementing is 100% his idea. So wow. like I said, there's, sure, we might have written the code, but like Tyler was the person who came up with the mechanism. So yeah, huge, huge shout out to him for that. I guess the, the next one we definitely need to mention are uh, Paul Dix and Andrew Lamb from, from InfluxDB. Basically, they're building something very similar in Rust. Mm -hmm. Actually, they've been building it for much longer than we have. <laughs> okay. And so they were kind of vital in, and, and they were very generous in sharing their experience of what they're building, which is InfluxDB IOX. It's kind of their next generation columnar database for that's going to, I think, back all of the Influx cloud product and they essentially have something super similar with the dynamic columns and they're also building on top of apache arrow and apache parquet so a lot of the foundational pieces are extremely similar and like mm. i said they were super generous and sharing their experience because we definitely would not be here this this soon this quickly in this kind of quality if it if they hadn't shared all of that experience yeah this is it right this is the secret to great teams and great products and great open source projects. Great people coming together over coffee or, you know, a meal, sharing ideas, and then the best ones win always. And the <laughs> bad ones eventually go away. <laughs> and there's lots and lots of bad ideas and there's a lot of fun to be had. So uh, they are important, but it's always like amazing people coming together and creating something amazing and then putting it out there and See what happens. I love that. He also mentioned Akili, Akili Roussel from Segment. And uh, that was oh, like another oh, yeah. shout out. And Julian Pivotto from the Prometheus team. Yeah, so 
I've never actually spoken to him in, in person, but um, I've spoken to to other people at Segment. I think mm-hmm. I think it's pronounced Ashil. So Ashil is an incredible engineer. Um, he's put together most of the Parquet Go library that we that we're using under the hood. And it was kind of a collaboration, like in January, I was doing research of like which Parquet libraries are out there. And I want to say I might have tweeted it or something like that. And and Ashil was like, I've got something for you. Mm-hmm. And at that point, the, the library was actually still closed source, like just segment was working on it uh, by themselves. And then they kind of open sourced it. And we've had a super tight collaboration. I want to say I've done 20 pull requests myself <laughs> against this library by now. Wow. And they're just... Like it's a very, very fine piece of engineering. Mm. Huge shout out. It's the APIs are just super thought through. The performance is just incredible. Like ArcDB would be nowhere if it wasn't for that work. Yeah. Wow. If listeners don't take away anything else from this conversation, it's check out that library. I like I'm a huge fan. Right. We'll put it in the show notes because that sounds like a very important one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So for those that stuck with us to this point, we need to talk about the Polar Signals Cloud because I'm sure that you want to hear about it. So what is the Polar Signals Cloud? Tell us about it. So in essence, Polar Signals Cloud is hosted Parka. (laughs) So basically, it's kind of the classic SaaS model, right? Like you want to reap all of the benefits of continuous profiling. You understand that it's useful, um, but you don't want to have to like maintain the backend system, the APIs, uptime, like storage efficiency and all of that, right? Running a distributed database, <laughs> um, all of those things. So basically the, the entire experience of Polar Signals Cloud is you just deploy the Parka agent on your Kubernetes cluster, you point it at Polar Signals Cloud and you're automatically profiling your entire infrastructure just like that. Like there's nothing else that you need to do. So yeah, that's that's the product that we're currently that we're working on. It's it's not generally available yet. We're trialing it with a couple of early beta customers. But yeah, I mean, if there are any any listeners that that think that they'd be a particularly good like case study for us, mm-hmm. please reach out. Uh, you can kind of sign up on our website. We'll get an get an email that you've signed up, and we can kind of chat and figure out if it if it makes sense. Yeah, I really like that simplicity of just setting up the agent and you have it all. I remember from when I used to set up Prometheus and Grafana on Kubernetes and um, managing them, the upgrades and all that. It's not difficult, but it's an extra thing that you have to do. And sometimes there's higher value things that you may want to do instead. Different use cases, different different uh, setups. I remember when we made the switch, and what a big difference that made. I remember when we set up the Honeycomb agent because you can't install Honeycomb, the, the, the UI and the server, just use it as, 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 a, as a service. And I really enjoy that experience, I have to say. Parka, I remember when I set everything up and I was thinking, huh, I wish there was just the agent. <laughs> Episode 33, right? Remember? And we had like the server and the UI, we talked about memory, we talked about a bunch of things. And now you have it six months later, like you're trialing it. And, you know, I mean, it's amazing to see that. My most important takeaway from our conversations, Frederick, I usually ask the guests, but this time I'll go first because I think it's so important to mention this, is how much I enjoy our interactions as like a very basic level, person to person. I really enjoy seeing the journey that you're on yourself with the company with the people that you know like work with you and get excited about your ideas and they see things the way you see things and it's been amazing to watch that you know as a bystander and every six months or every few months actually it hasn't been that long when when i check in there's always something new and exciting that you have out there shipping arctic db was such a huge achievement Seeing you at KubeCon EU, the stand, the, the excitement that was generated, it was great to see. And you are still like such a small team. So that story from a human, like one-to-one, to a team, to a product, to a company, it's been great to watch. And great people do great things. I don't know. I mean, it may sound a bit cliche, but it is what it is. You know, <laughs> there, there's no secret. You know, if you truly believe, if you have like, you, if you're aligned, and everything like what you say and what you do and what you think, they're all the same. The sky's the limit. 
it's been great, you know, seeing that come together. And Polar Signals Cloud, I'm really looking forward to trying it out because um, I've seen like what the world looked like before and I want to see what it looks like after. And I have a good feeling about this. So let's see how well it works in practice. I have no doubts, but I still want to see it. <laughs> yeah. So what about your key takeaway for the audience? You mentioned about the people a little bit, about Arctic DB, and um, we can take the key takeaway, but maybe first, like, what are you thinking in the next six months? Where are you going with the Polar Signals Cloud? What do you expect to happen next? Just the few things that you can share. Yeah, um, I mean, we want to GA the product, right? Uh, we want to make it as accessible to anyone who wants to as as much as we can. Like you said, right? Like it, it, it'll really only take deploying the agent and you're automatically profiling your entire infrastructure. That said, we want to make sure because profiling is one of those, it's kind of like with any other data problem. If people don't trust the data, that's a huge problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you like the, people lose confidence in a product very quickly when that happens. And so it's something we want to be careful that when we do make the product generally available, that it is very solid and that people can rely, depend mm -hmm. on it and, and trust it most, most importantly, right? So yeah, that's kind of our mission for the, for, for all of this year, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we'll see, right? Like there's definitely a lot of, there's so much opportunity to build things on top of continuous profiling. Mm. There are very exciting things that you can do with this data that isn't just as a human analyzing this data, right? But yeah, just kind of going back to what you were saying, I think, I don't think I realized it as much before going into this call, but because you and I have been kind of checking in every six months or so, mm -hmm. it's just mind blowing to kind of check in on the growth of the company of the people of the project mm -hmm. because you know i'm very close to all of it so i don't necessarily see like i see small changes right but i if i then look back six months and and think about all of the things that we achieved i'm just like i'm blown away yeah i, I couldn't decide whether that is my top thing or you know, something that we kept on bringing up about Arctic DB is kind of how important community is and how important leveraging your network. But also, I think whenever I talk about that, I also have to talk about sharing your network, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the most powerful thing you can possibly do to someone else, right? Like give people access to your network. Mm -hmm. It'll like put their careers or their projects or whatever it is on like hyperspeed, right? I think that's something... Something I learned early on in my career and like in both directions, like it's helped me tremendously, but I also try to give it onwards as much as I can. That's a good one. That's a good one. Well, Frederick, I will definitely check in again in six months time. <laughs> but what I would like to do is keep like in closer, in closer contact because I'm seeing some of the amazing things that you're building and six months, it's almost, it's almost like we're not doing justice to all the amazing things that, you know, come out of Polar Signals, the connections that you make, the ideas that you generate. And I think, I think I would like to share a bit more of that because there's a lot of amazing stuff going on. And um, I think time, that's the only limit, <laughs> you know, time, and, like there's only so many hours in the day and there's only like your attention and your mind share is limited, but definitely worth it. So thank you for joining me here today. Thank you for sharing all the wonderful things. And I'm looking forward to what you do next. It will be great. I'm sure of it. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> thank you for tuning into another episode of Ship It. Check out our other podcasts for developers at changelog.com slash master. You can connect with like-minded developers by changelog.com slash community. Thank you Fastly for the worldwide low latency changelog.com. Our listeners love those blazing fast MP3s. Your beats are awesome, Breakmaster Cylinder. That's it for this week. See you all next week. My last thought for today is the takeaways from the first year of Ship It. I've been reviewing all the transcripts for the first 30 episodes, and there are a lot of incredible insights in them. I'm thinking blog posts and slides. What do you think?